I thought so. That's how the year of Jubilee began. Right? That's how the year of Jubilee begins. Every 50 years, across the entire people, a horn would blow. It'd actually be a, a bigger one, a ram's horn, so a far longer one. This is a, a merely, I think it's a cow's horn. But uh, this is the sound that would call people home, the homecoming that you waited for, so to speak. It's a, a calling to come back to your family if your family had been split, a, fa a call to come back to your farm if you had lost your farm. If you think about what this promise is about the Jubilee, the returning to your family land, you all know what it means to have a family farm, right? You all are in this area, we know what it means to be connected to the land, right? To hear this sound is to be told you can go home to the land. It doesn't matter if your father had to sell it, doesn't matter if your grandfather had to give it up because of debt, you can go home. And you can hear this uh, when you hear this sound. The, the name of this is a shofar, but the name of the actual sound, the note that's played, is a joval, which is where we get jubilee, right, or jubilation, joy. This is the sound that brought people joy, even though it is kind of raucous and harsh to actually hear. This is the sound you hear, and think about your, sort of the emotional response people would have when they hear this, right? You, you have not walked on your father's land for 20 years, and you hear that sound, and now it's the family land again. Right? You have not been able to go home, you've had to go home to your family that has been split by debt, servitude, and you can go home and say, fa your family is going to be joined together tonight for dinner for the first time in years. Right? This is the year of Jubilee, and the year of Jubilee is described in Leviticus 25. What it is, is a generational course correction. A generational course correction for an entire economy, the purpose of which was to prevent the ruin of those who had gone into debt and to make sure that there would not be this ever-growing gap between rich and poor. It's an amazing plan, this year of Jubilee, because it's a bulwark against two extremes. One extreme is the excesses of capitalism, where... Uh, Capital is concentrated in the hands of the few, right? And so capital skews in one direction. So more, the 1%, the 10% the the have more and more. And, the, and this is a, a rejection both of that, but also it's a rejection, a bulwark of the excesses of the other extreme, socialism, the idea that the state would control more and more and more. What this is in the year of Jubilee is a pro-small farm economic plan designed for the good of the local economy. Think about what, what that means, right? This is a making sure that the small farms never become big corporate farms. The families will always be returned to the family land. And if you, if you have to sell yourself into debt, families will not be destroyed by debt. They will, because the, those who have sold themselves into servitude will, on the Jubilee, be released to go home and to be rejoined with their family. To use some of the terminology we learned last week about uh, clean and unclean, in Leviticus, uh, it talks often about clean and unclean. Clean is normal. Clean is how we're supposed to live. Clean is what God is describing throughout Leviticus. And so unclean is the exception. Unclean is what we're trying to, to avoid like living in again and again and again. And so Leviticus lays out, how do you get from unclean to clean? It provides on an individual level, if you're unclean, you wash yourself, go to the priest, great, you're done. If you're unclean as a community, you can, the whole community can sacrifice a bull and, and go to the priest, and, and then that you can return, turn back to God, and get clean, get normal again. The year of Jubilee is the way, not just for an entire community, but an entire people, to get back to the norms that God desires us to live, right? It takes a while, right? If you think about... How long would it take for you to destroy your life today? You go online, you get on your online banking, you could mess your up, yourself up pretty fierce in one day. It takes a little bit longer for an entire community to get off track. How long does it take for an entire people to get off track? Well, about a generation, about 50 years, right? So that's why this Jubilee is laid out as the every 50th year is the response that God gives for an entire people to, to do a course correction of their economy. And it's based upon the understanding that sin adds up, right? Sin adds up over time. Well, and, and we can see the impacts of how this does add up, or, up over time if we look at the history of Israel. If you look at the beginning of Israel's history, 
all the uh, houses were about the same size. You go, uh, go into the archaeological records, pretty egalitarian. Everyone had about the same size house. The further you go into the history, some houses got a lot bigger. Most houses got a lot smaller, right? And they got kind of clustered together. And so we can see that there was a, a problem there, a growing divide between those who had a lot, those who joined house to house and joined field to field, as the prophet Isaiah puts it, and, and those who, who were... Uh, ending up needy. And so in, as this inequality grows, um, there's another thing that aggravates it. After the exile, what pushes this inequality further and pushes the need for, an ex, for the, the jubilee is a shift in how you paid taxes. Right? Today you pay taxes by writing a check. Right? Before the exile, back in the first days of the nation of Israel, they didn't use money. And so if you think about what you paid your taxes in, the thing you had you could give was food. Right? If you were a farmer, you could give your grain or you could give your livestock. And so your taxes would be something like one-tenth of what you grew. And so if you had a great year, you gave one-tenth of what you grew. You had a bad year, you gave one-tenth of what you grew. That changes when, after the exile, Persia is over that area of the world, and now taxes are assessed based upon money. Money is introduced. And you know the funny thing about money is, you know this, it doesn't care whether you have a job or not. Your property tax shows up, doesn't it? Right? And so these folks who had, had for centuries had been paying their taxes by giving one-tenth of what they grew or a quarter of what they grew or something like that, now they were told, you're going to pay this many dollars. And if you can't pay it this year, you've got to pay it next year, and it accrues. And, and so the invention of, of money, the use of money as the way that people uh, taxed each other, became uh, this sort of thing that drove Israel further. That, that's what drove the people to have some people having bigger and bigger houses and some people having smaller and smaller houses. And, and so the Israelite people needed something to, to respond to this. this they needed an economic corrective, and that's what we have as the Jubilee. Right, the Jubilee, it, it begins with the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is an act of worship turning to God, and it reminds us, the Day of Atonement does, with the year of Jubilee, that we are supposed to live in a certain cycle. Right? Every seventh day, we're supposed to rest. Every seventh year, the fields are supposed to lie fallow. And every seven sevens, every seven Sabbath years, the four, after the 49th year, that's when this rhythm kicks in, and one more time, the, the shofars are blown, and it is time for the year of Jubilee. It's time to be reminded again that this is not my land, it's God's land, we just happen to live on it. Now having the year of Jubilee on the horizon down the road, that would change how you did business, wouldn't it? All right? It would change how you did business. If a farmer has a bad run, a year or two of a bad run, and he has to sell the farm, is it gone forever? No. The year of Jubilee is on the horizon. And depending how far out it is, it, that, that changes how much he gets paid for it and how much he has to pay if he wants it back. If you're a farmer and you get, go through a bad run and you have 25 years to the Jubilee, you, you will sell the farm for a certain amount of money. And let's say you go off and you work as a hired hand for 10 years and you want to come back and buy the farm back. How much do you have to pay? Well, the Jubilee is, is every 50 years. You, if he had sold it at 25 years till the Jubilee, he had to pay half of the value, and then add another 10 years at 2% lower every year, because you're getting closer and closer to Jubilee, now he only has to pay 15% of the value. Right? And so the redemption of the land, it was a lot harder to lose the land, to lose it for a long time, because you could always work your way back to, to buying it back again, because the price went down every year, because you're not buying the land, you're buying the number of years of crops that you get. And and if you do this, uh, it, let's say you can't do it. Let's say that you get so far down you have to sell yourself in, into servi servitude to pay off your debts, right? Are your children going to be indebted? Are your children going to be in slavery the rest of their lives? No. Jubilee year is going to hit. And at some point in their lives, they're going to be freed to go back to the family land that you lost. Right? That it, Jubilee is a response not just to get the economy, a course corrected for the economy, it's also a way to make sure that children are not doomed because of the sins of the parents. How often do we see that? Children suffering for the idiocy of parents. This is a one way to, to grapple with that. Now, I, I don't want to paint this as some sort of utopia, some sort of perfect thing that, that what was just wonderful. I mean, there are still some issues with the Jubilee system. It still favored the city. 
Uh, if you sold land in the city, it was gone. Right? You didn't get it back after at most 50 years. Right? And if you were an immigrant and you were, uh, became a servant, you could become a permanent slave. It was still centuries off before Isaiah would say that uh, Israel would be a light to the nations. So there are some flaws to this system, some, some things about it. Uh, we're not sure how often Jubilee was practiced. Right? This is a big, this is a big uh, practice every 50 years to have all the land revert back to the families. Uh, we know that like in Nehemiah 5 it was practiced. After the exile, uh, we know it, it happened then. We know that the prophet Jeremiah redeemed a field using the Jubilee approach. Uh, it's in Jeremiah 32. But we're not sure how well it was practiced or how often it was practiced. But what we do know is that the prophets never forgot it. The prophets never forgot the year of Jubilee. The prophet Ezekiel kept on telling the people, Jubilee will be practiced again. The prophet Daniel says, Jubilee teaches us something about how God is going to treat the world in, in the end. The prophet Isaiah talks about the year of Jubilee, proclaiming that there will be liberty for the captives and release of the prisoners. And then Jesus' first sermon is quoting the prophet Isaiah. Jesus' first sermon, talking about the day of the Lord's favor, is quoting the prophet Isaiah, who's talking about the year of the Jubilee. When Jesus teaches the Lord's Prayer, forgives us, forgive us our debts as we forgive our, our debtors, you know what he's referencing? Year of Jubilee. Right? It becomes the basis for what Jesus is teaching as well. And so the year of Jubilee reminds us that every generation or two, we may need to do something drastic to get back on track as a nation, as a people, as an economy. And the challenge thus that the year of Jubilee presents us with is twofold. First, we have to be able to see that we need, need, a diff we need something, right? There has to be a, an acknowledgement on our part that our economy needs a, a, a course correction, right? Well, in 2014, 1,006,600 and nine families declared bankruptcy. What do you think about that, right? Most of them are due to medical debt. In, uh, from 2009 to 2012, the recovery from the great debacle called 2008, 95% of all income growth went to the wealthiest 1% of the population. According to the Wall Street Journal, that liberal source of news, right? The Wall Street Journal, that's about as straight-laced as it gets. Right? So I do think we have an economy that is off kilter. And the challenge then becomes, how do we apply the year of Jubilee today? Who here makes your living off of a farm? Stan? And who else? And Jean? Uh, Stan and Jean? The Pages? Yes? <laughs> the Page family? Is anyone else in, in here make your living off of a farm? So, I mean, that, that's a challenge. How does the year of Jubilee apply, right? No, anyone here are selling children into debt slavery? Right? Not, that doesn't happen anymore. So the challenge is how do we take the year of Jubilee with its concerns for debt and land and apply them today? How do we pray and, and pray for the Spirit to guide us, to be scripturally inspired, uh, to take a swing at this? I, I'm going to take a swing at this, and, and I'm going to do it with great hesitancy because... I reserve the right to be wrong, and I might be about to exercise it, but holding the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other, this is the conclusions that, that I've come to, at least. The concern for, the, for those in debt, right? that's one of the two main fo foci, focuses of the, the year of Jubilee, debt and land. The, the focus on debt. If you're down and you need help paying a utility bill and you don't have the money, you go to a payday loan place, all right? Anyone want to guess what the average payday loan interest rate is? It's three digits. Right. As of 2015, February 2015, the average payday loan in Missouri was pay charging 452% interest. All right. I'm not certain that if, I, if Leviticus was written today that the year of Jubilee would explicitly say payday loans are evil and sinful, but maybe I would. Right? I think that's evil. I think that's wrong. Right? There's got to be a better way. The other concern other than debt is uh, land. Right? Land. If you don't have land in those early centuries, you're doomed. I don't stay up at night worrying that I'm doomed because I can't, I'm not going to be able to feed my family because I don't have land. What you're not going to be able to feed your family if you don't have in this, in this, in this uh, economy we have today is education. If you don't have education, you're doomed. Right? That, that's just 
how it is now. You need to have high school and then something more. And so something more, you got to go to some sort of college. And generationally, I was talking to someone in Green City, uh, gave me the perfect example. 42 years ago, Truman cost $120 a semester plus $99 a month in room and board. And so less than $2,000 a year, you could go to Truman or at Northeast Missouri State at the time. Uh, the, she told me her dad gave her a heifer and that was it. That was her college. She was done, right? I worked three jobs all summer long, uh, waited tables, waited tables, and made, made whistles. I did not see my parents. I did not go to church. I didn't do anything other than sweat that entire summer. And I could not make more than one third of what Truman cost in one year. Right? You used to be able to go to college working all summer long, then you go to college and you go come back, work all summer long, and go to college. You can't do that now. And so student loans have kicked in. And student loans, there is now more outstanding student loans than there are credit cards with an 11% default rate. 11% are over 90 days in default right now. As a nation, something's going to have to change on student loans because you cannot make a future for yourself without high school plus tech school, without training, without, so on the, without something. You need high school plus something. And if you're going to go, average student loan debt right now is 24 grand a year. If you're going to go into $24,000 of debt, and you're 21, and you walk out with a $400 to $700 payment a month, you're not getting married. You're not starting a family. You're not buying a house. Right? Something about our nation, we're going to have to change how we do that. A little bit closer to home and maybe a little bit more practically for us, the first start, before you can get to college, you've got to get out of high school. Right? You've got to get out of high school. And, and Jubilee, what Jubilee calls us to do is to make sure that we are providing a good education for those who are here. And we can do something about that. That brick school up there on the hill, it was built in 1925, wasn't it? Right? It had a 75-year lifespan. You can do the math. We need a new school. I don't know the local politics why this community has not voted to fund paying a new school. All I can say is I know what bad bricks looks like. I've seen bad brick. It is terrifying. This is a wonderfully built building designed to live, work, last 100 years, and we're still dumping lots of money into our brick. That building, we need a new school. That's all I can say about that. I could be wrong. I could, maybe I'm misreading the year of Jubilee. Maybe we could sit down and drink some coffee together and, and come up with a better way of reading it. But this is, this is what I think the year of Jubilee calls us to do. I think it calls us to do things like support a reform of payday loans, which comes up for the Missouri State Legislature on occasion. I, I, I think it calls us to uh, be aware that student debt for college and for trade schools has to be changed in these coming years. And I think it calls us to be willing to even vote to increase our local taxes because our children of this community need a school. They need an education. Right? That's what the, the year of Jubilee calls us. And finally, it calls us to be aware that no matter how bad today is, that call is always out there. There is always going to be a, a shofar called, uh, calling, and uh, one day we, t we really will come to a day of freedom. And, and whether it's in this life or in the kingdom of God to come, God, God's news is always good. Amen. Let us, let us join together in the words of